Hi there, welcome back to the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation channel. I'm looking forward to today's message um, that Father has placed upon my heart. And I must just say, His fingerprints is all over this, and I just give Him all the glory for what He wants to, um, the message that He wants to um, bring across to His church. And um, as you can see, I'm going to talk about the true revival that will break out, the Acts 2.0. And um, this is also to just bring understanding of what we can expect, but also to give, also to be an exhortation with regards to the uh, deception that will be during this time. So it's very important that we understand that we need to under to know our word. We need to understand the types and shadows, and um, not be uh, drawn away um, by. Uh, various things but you understand that the word of god is our plumb line and we need to stick to it um you know whenever we think that we are not uh, that we cannot be deceived we make a grave mistake we need to be careful especially in this time that we are in because deception is sky high so i'm going to talk about true revival versus the counterfeit and um, i also want to just once again mention and I'm probably going to do it with every devotional because we need to understand it, that the, the workers, the church in this end time that we are in now is both an apostolic and a prophetic entity. Apostolic in the sense that they are sent out with great authority and prophetic in the sense that the church is a demonstration of the cross, not just by how we live, but also by how we lay our lives down. So whenever you saw the prophets, their whole life became the message. So our lives are the message. Okay, so um, the other thing that I want to bring to your attention is that the word says that that which was shall be again. So we should expect these things in the word of God that we see as a type and shadow that it will happen again. So the Acts outpouring will happen again, but a greater degree, which I will discuss later. And then we uh, 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 need to understand that when John the Revelator was giving the letters, were given the letters for the seven churches, that we are again going to enter into the first church, which is Ephesus, right through to Laodicea. We are now at the moment in the church of Laodicea. Lukewarmness and all those kind of things. And deception and, uh, you know, uh, just the chaos and everything that's happening at the moment. But when revival, true revival will break out, we will once again start with the church of Ephesus. And the letters of the church of Ephesus, uh, letter of church for the church of Ephesus will be applicable then, then Smyrna as we go on right through again. So it will repeat itself. So I want to start with um, with uh, Moses because Father uh, uh, very much placed Moses upon my heart and um, he gave me the number, number 77 to look up and I saw that it was just a city in Issachar and I, I looked up the city's uh, meaning, the name of the city and I saw that it meant a flash of light to glow, to shine, or to gleam. So I knew definitely that, um, you know, we know that Moses came down from the mountain and he was glowing and the glory of the Lord was shining upon him. And um, so I knew Father was directing me definitely to Moses. So first of all, I, I want to tell you about a servant of God, Sister Donna. She uh, made a video on her, her channel um, where she was relaying a dream that she needed somebody to keep the interpretation of. And I will be um, relaying that dream. She gave me permission in this um, devotional teaching. But um, this brought us actually together um, where we, where, uh, I am interpreting uh, her dreams for her. And this is just a gift that Father has given me. It's got nothing to do with me. Uh, Joseph told Pharaoh that when he wanted the interpretations of the dreams, the interpretation is not of me, but of God. So it's a gift that he can take away any moment. All the glory belongs to him. So what happened is I interpreted um, a dream that for her that I placed uh, or uh, downloaded on my channel um, yesterday. And she, her reply to me is what I actually quickly want to discuss because it holds hands to um, what our father wants to tell us. She said to me that uh, I am just like her. 
And what she meant with that was that I have an understanding of the suffering and the persecution one goes through when God uses a person um, to the degree that he's using us. And um, But Father wanted me to take note. Very often people will say something to me. They, what they mean is a complete different thing. Um, but my spirit, I have a check in my spirit when they say something. And I know that he is pointing me to something else as well then. So in this case, when she said to me, you are just like me, it had a great purpose because it followed the words. She said that the Holy Spirit started talking to her and saying this to her. Um, she said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, go my little donkey of the Lord. And what a little donkey she is. For my little donkey will open her mouth and amazing revelation knowledge will come out of her. Go now and let the world know that God is still talking through his little donkey. So this was of such great significance when she said that, especially when she said I was just like her, because I have never spoken to Donna, Sister Donna, before this. So she knows nothing about me, and frankly, I know nothing about her. Um, but she said this, and then when the moment she said this, I was reminded of a dream that Father gave me about one and a half to two years ago, where I was in a field, and I saw um, in a camp a donkey standing by the side of the fence, and the next moment I saw a very attractive man with a royal blue office suit walking towards the donkey. And he embraced this donkey around the neck and the donkey placed its neck on his shoulder. Very important, his shoulder. And these two were just loving each other. <laughs> it's just the most beautiful thing. And that was the end of the dream. And when I woke up, Father said to me, embrace your office. And what he meant with that is... Probably about six years ago, I was minding my own business, eating my dinner at my, uh, my mother-in-law's at a table, just eating dinner and just, you know, enjoying it. And the next moment I heard the words in my spirit, you are a priest unto me. So with this dream, he was saying to me, embrace the office of priest that I've given you. Okay. So... With this number 77 and this gleaming and I, I woke up this morning and once again he told me again to look up number 77 and this time my focus went to the name Issachar and I thought okay let me look up the name Issachar. Now Issachar was one of the tribes or the children of Jacob and um, it's, he was uh, Leah's, one of Leah's sons and Jacob had two wives. Leah and Rachel. So Issachar was one of Leah's um, sons. So Jacob in Genesis 49 um, speaks a blessing over Issachar and this is what he says about him. In one of the translations it says, you are a raw boned donkey lying down among the sheep pens. So in the King James Version, it says, a strong as couching down between two burdens. So the sheep pens becomes two burdens and the raw boned um, is an ass, a raw boned donkey, a strong as couching down. So he's lying down with the sheep. So immediately we have the donkey, that's the focus, and the sheep, that is a burden. Okay, And it says here in the King James Version, verse 4, 15 it says and he saw that rest was good and the land that is is that it was pleasant and bowed his shoulder remember the donkey placed his head on the shoulder bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute so this donkey is lying amongst the sheep and he is a servant and he's bowing his shoulder to bear a burden so strong boned or raw boned means strong boned and that's H1634. And couching is H7257 and it means to recline or lay or rest. Another, uh, for me immediately this reclining points to John who reclined next to Yeshua with his head on his chest, his, his heart is close to him. Okay, so, and he's in rest, that means faith, right? 
So the two burdens is H4942. And those two burdens means fireplaces or ash heap or sheepfold. All three highly significant. The two burdens are fireplaces, ash heap or sheepfold. Fireplaces speaks of uh, sanctification because we are sanctified through fire, through suffering. The ash heap speaks of priesthood because the, um, the priests receive the fat of the ash heaps when the burnt offerings were done. They receive the best, the choicest. I will get to that now. And then the burden is also a sheepfold. In other words, the sheep is a burden unto the donkey, so to speak. He carries that burden on his shoulder. So his shoulder is H7926, and it means the neck between the shoulder as the place of burdens. And the word servant, it says the donkey will be a servant unto tribute, is H5647, and it means to work, labor, serve with Levitical service. Worshippers, bondmen, and slaves. All these words are very significant with where Father is going with this. So, what do we know about a donkey? It's a workhorse. It's a worker. Okay, so the workers are his donkeys. So, Issachar, there's another Issachar in the Word of God as well, and he was one of the sons of Urbet Edom, which is a type and shadow of the Holy Spirit that saved or a uh, 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 reserved or hid a remnant in the caves of um, God's prophets, a hundred of them, whilst Elijah was hiding from Jezebel after the whole Baal prophet showdown. So at that time, um, Elijah was saying, get me out of here. And the Lord said, no, 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 there are a hundred more that I have put away. So that is, Issachar was one of the sons of Urbet Edom, and he was a Levite. Okay, once again pointing to priesthood. And he's one of the doorkeepers of the temple and one of the capable men with the strength to work. That is what the Strong's Concordance tells us. So once again, you get the strength, you get the Leviticalness, uh, the priesthood, and um, you're getting the fact that he's a worker. So Moses also spoke a blessing over Issachar, okay, the tribe. And this is what he said. He said about Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in your going out. Who's going out? An apostle is being sent out, right? In your going out, and you, Issachar, in your tents. They will summon, who will summon? Zebulun and Issachar. They will summon peoples to the mountain, and they offer, they offer the sacrifices of the righteous. They will feast on the abundance of the seas, on the treasures in the sand. So, Immediately, we need to understand that this mountain that the, they will draw the people to is Mount Zion. And an example of this is, or what this refers to, is the great harvest that the workers will bring in um, with a reference to the triumphal entry. And in the triumphal entry, Yeshua came in on a donkey. And the people greeted him, shouting, Hosanna, and they were waving palm trees. Very important. They were waving palm trees. And we see this in Revelation 7 or 14, one of the two. And the people were dressed in white, the righteous, that came through the tribulation, right? They're standing before the throne, and they are waving palm trees. So the triumphal entry, right, is a type and shadow of Mount Zion, where Yeshua is standing the land with the righteous before him, waving palm trees. Okay, so um, he's riding on a donkey. So the workers are bringing in this harvest to the king. Then we read in uh, uh, Hebrews 3 verse 1, we find how Moses is a type and shadow of Christ. We know this, but specifically with apostleship. Hebrews 3 verse 1 and 2 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Who are the partakers of the heavenly calling? The workers. Right? They've got a calling. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So Yeshua was a high, he's a high priest and an apostle. Then it says, who was faithful to him that appointed him? 
as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Okay, so we see the correlation between the two. So the apostle, the word apostle in Hebrews 3 verse 1 is G652 and it means a messenger, a delegate, one sent forth with orders with miraculous powers. That's what an apostle is. As somebody that's sent out, that is what the workers will be. They will be sent out, they will, will be endowed with great authority and will have miraculous powers. So Moses is actually our example of the first apostle that was sent out. And we know the Lord did great, great miracles through him. But the first encounter that the Lord actually met up with Moses or spoke to him was on the Mount of Horeb. Now, that is where he met with the burning bush. And the burning bush um, is very interesting. Um, I actually remembered <clears throat> when I was... Um, when Father was talking to me about Moses, um, I remember that somewhere in one of the teachings that I listened to way back, that the burning bush was actually from the acacia tree. And But I, when I thought of that, I just dismissed it. I didn't make much of it. Just It was just a thought that came up. And um, about two days after that, of remembering that, I saw that my Telegram account was, I had 63 um, subscribers. And whenever my numbers fluctuate, I look up the numbers because almost 100% of the time he has a message for me through it. So I don't mind when they fluctuate up or down. He has a purpose with it. So um, the number 63 means a place in the lowlands of Moab from the words Abel and Shatar. And Shatar actually means acacia. So it's a tree and a wood. So it's in this case a shrub. They believe it was a shrub, not a massive tree. And in that time, you know, the acacia was very dry and um, it was a regular thing to see these bushes burning. But what caught his attention is that this bush, and bush didn't stop burning. So obviously Moses had seen many of these trees on his, as he was uh, amongst tending his, the flock. Um, so it was nothing new, but the difference was that this one kept on burning. And um, I thought to do some research upon uh, about this. Um, the acacia tree, and I came upon a biblical hermeneutics uh, site, and this is what they had to say about this, um, which holds great significance to what Father wants to tell the workers. So they, quoting from what the site says, they said, speaking about the burning bush, according to rabbinic understanding, just as the bush was the thorniest of all trees in the world, in that any bird that entered into it could not manage to exit without tearing itself limb from limb. Likewise was the slavery of Israel in Egypt the most oppressive slavery in the world. So we know that Yeshua wore a crown on his head, right? And we know that his body was torn, much like this any bird that would be caught in this acacia bush. They further say the burning bush conveys the imagery of the Lord's compassion and identification with the humiliation and suffering of his people. Think of the tribulation. That is, the Lord was in the fire of the burning bush. The Lord appears in the smaller thorn bush, not the big bushes or trees. The burning bush appears not only in parallel to the condition of the Israelites in Egypt, which is the iron furnace, but also as a, per, a prison, since the thorns preclude any escape. So we know they were slaves, they were imprisoned, and they were in a fire of furnace. And so the Lord appears in, in this affliction of a fiery, fiery bush unto Moses. And they say, please note, the Lord did not appear to Moses in the glorious cedars of Lebanon or from other such lofty plain. Thus the thorn bush represents the lowliest in the country contradistinction to trees of glory. So the first place the Lord meets up with Moses was in the place of humility, in the place of a, a furnace of fire, affliction of thorns, of imprisonment, of identification with the suffering of his people. This is where Moses meets him and this is a, a type and shadow of the preparation that Yeshua does with his priests because he, the, the burning bush is a type and shadow 
of the zeal and the compassion and the heart of God to those who are in affliction and suffering. And Moses are looking and standing still, looking into this bush in identification with God's suffering for his people. And because he identifies with God's suffering, he is now as a high priest, identifying. He is now as a type and shadow in Christ, identifying with the Father's compassion upon his people. And so a priest has the responsibility to identify both with the people and with God. He stands as mediator between God and man and is either willing to give his life or lay his life down in the way he lives. That is the high calling of the priests of God, of the workers, to lay their lives down for his people. And so once he works out that disposition, as he did with Moses, in his workers, they, get, they then get their instructions and they are appointed then to go forth to Pharaoh and say, say let my people go. So Moses was the first apostle to be sent. So first we find that it's Mount Horeb is the place of meeting, of preparation, of priesthood. Okay. Um, then this, that account is in Exodus 3. Okay. Then in Exodus 19, we found Mount Sinai. And so they are actually close to one another. I think they're opposite Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai, are opposite each other, where Mount Horeb is just as insignificant like the, the uh, acacia bush in, apart to the cedars of Lebanon. So is the Mount, Mount Horeb insignificant in comparison with Mount Sinai, right? So it's first the humility, it's first the bowing down of the shoulder, it's first entering into that priesthood and entering into the suffering by identification in your own suffering, what you go through in preparation, that he prepares you before you go up to the mountain of Sinai where you meet the glory of God and meet him face to face. So both the, the humility of the tree and the mountain is seen in Mount Horeb. And so now we go to Mount Sinai, and Mount Sinai um, actually means thorny, where Mount Horeb means the uh, uh, um, desolate, uh, uh, it means, let me just see what it means. It means desert, desolate, um, wasteland, dried up, very much like my um, first uh, a video that I made on the channel is called Save to Serve and I speak about the eunuchs and how the uh, eunuchs are dried up. They cannot produce from out of themselves so they are servants, they are bond slaves. They are completely given, they can't produce from out of themselves. They, that whatever they do, they uh, given over to their master as a bond slave. They cannot produce from out themselves, so in weakness they completely dependent on his strength. Okay, so that is what Mount Horeb does to you. So um, the Mount Sinai again is called Thorny. And one would think it would have been called something beautiful, as in you know, um, uh, glory or majesty or you know something majestic, but instead it's called Thorny, and it's almost as if. Um, by the time Moses had come there, he is in complete identification with priesthood, with the suffering of the children of Israel. So, um, and Mount Sinai, he is already in that identification with the bush, so to speak, with that furnace. And he, he, God meets him and shows him his back, his shoulder, right? And um, later on, it says that with Moses, he spoke face to face. And there he receives the instructions of the commandments and he experiences God's glory, which was a, very much a fearful thing, a fearful thing that happened. Um, and he comes down and his face is shining, the number 77, right? Gleaming, shining, glow. And his face is shining with the glory of God upon him. And the people uh, that want his face covered because they couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle the glory. Interesting. Interesting. Let us remember that with great power and with great glory comes the responsibility to be able to uphold and maintain it. 
right? That great glory and authority and the power. And that comes through a character that has been molded through suffering and gone through the furnace of affliction to be able to endure whatever will come. So this glory is not meant for everybody. It's meant for those that have been prepared. Okay? So those, the, the people, the multitude at the bottom of the mountain tells tells Moses, please cover your face. We cannot handle the glory that is upon you. They were in fear. Remember all these types and shadows. Okay. So he was filled with the Spirit of God. So first it's Horeb and then at Sinai. So he's coming down the mountain and he's fasted now for 40 days and 40 nights. I'm sure in the, mount, in the mountainous area, in the desert area, um, going up that mountain must have been very difficult for him. So he goes up the mountain and he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights without water. No water, nothing. Living on the glory of God, <laughs> so to speak. And um, he comes down and, and the Lord God tells him he hears the noise um, down um, in the plain. And uh, Moses better go down. And Moses come down. And what, is he, what does he find? A little revival happening there right around the golden calf. And these people decided, you know what, Moses? You, you're just taking too long, you know. We don't know when you, in fact, we don't even if you'll be able to come down, seeing what's happening up there, you're probably not going to come. You're probably dead. And you know what? Um, we're just going to start our own revival. And we're going to make God in our image. Um, and we're choosing Baal. So um, we're making him in our image. And they had their little revival. And make no mistake, what happened on Mount Sinai was the revival, the true thing. And it was a spiritual encounter. And just so much on the, uh, uh, in the desert where all the multitude was around their golden calf that was also a spiritual encounter they were worshipping so we have the true and we have the counterfeit we have the, the, the one person versus a multitude please this is very important that you see this type in shadows so he is enraged when he sees this and he commands uh, them to um, to turn this golden calf into dust, mix it with water, and they had to drink it. What it means is that the golden calf is also a, a type and shadow of, of uh, um, the mark of the beast, but it's also a type of shadow of people being given over to their desires because what they did around that calf was uh, uh, they were given over to their desires, to the flesh. They were all in euphoria. They were dancing and it was joyous and it was like a revival. So they were doing all this around this golden calf. And he was, when they had to eat it, they were given over to their desires, so to speak. He let them be in their deception. Seeing that you want a God in your own image, I will give you over to your God and your God over to you. And you can remain in your deception because you are not willing to go up the, to the mountain and experience God face to face, lest he show you what is truly in your heart. Idolatrous nation, very adulterous. So they are fooled and deceived by their emotions and what they feel and given over to it. So at a later stage, he also, the, there was an incident where this happens again and Moses comes down, right? And he then tells, the, uh, asks who is on his side and only the tribe of Levite. Remember, the donkey says Levitical service, the two burdens means Levitical service. And only the tribe of Levi comes and say they are on his side. And he commands them to take their swords. Think of the word of God. Take their swords and slay mother, father, brother, sister, everybody who partook in the second uh, uh, adulterous act, act. So they were slayed. Okay, And that talks about the ultimacy and the totality towards God that these priests had. Because they themselves have gone through. They have been slain themselves. They are dried up. They've had their Mount Horeb experience. They are bond slaves. They are servants of the Most High God. Do not think twice before slaying brother, mother, father, sister with the truth of the word of God. Hallelujah. So, um, that tells you of the, the type of priests that they were. So what is the difference between Moses um, called to the upper room, so to speak, up the mountain, 
we was told, come up and be here. Don't say a word. Come up and be here. Don't be busy with all these things. Just come up and be here with me and I will come down. Versus um, those who stayed with the crowd, those who stayed down, um, both apparently experienced glory. Glory. Okay, so let's see the differences. Moses were called up to come out of the camp, to separate himself. He fasted, which was an act of humbling his soul. The crowd were following the crowd, right? Nobody said there, maybe we should also go up. Maybe we should separate ourselves from these people and, and, and see God on this side. No, they were following the crowd. Moses was taking too long, okay? So they had pride in their hearts and they didn't want to wait anymore. They wanted a quick fix. This needs to happen now, okay? This looks like fun. Moses was to be, that is to say, be still. And Moses came down to hear the noise. Moses had a Mount Hurup experience of identification. Um, and the crowd did not have identification as priests. Moses was an apostle, the first sent one, chosen. The crowd were not chosen. They were not called up because they didn't have a Mount Hurup experience. The multitude were drawn to that which is sensual, quick and exciting. Both were spiritual experiences. One true, the other a counterfeit. Moses experienced the glory, the outpouring of the Spirit, but the multitude had to eat dust, so to speak, given over to their desire. So I want us to go to Psalm 23. And a particular verse is verse 5, which shows us, um, gives us an uh, indication of the, uh, the order that these things will happen. Verse, and you know, a lot of people have caught on Psalm 23 for, for uh, 2023, and I believe it's very applicable. So verse 5 tells us, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. So first we have a table, then we have anointing, and then we have the cup that runs over. The table in the Strong's is H7979, and it means a meal at the king's table, right? And it is from H7971, and it means to send, to be sent, shoot forth. Doesn't that sound like an apostle? Where is that table? Where is that table? That table, I believe, is in Mount Horeb. That's where it is. Because there he meets with that tree, the wood, the tree. of, And he's eating at the same table. Where do we find about the table? In John 6, where Yeshua says, If you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. What he was saying is, If you are not willing to share in my suffering and eat at my table, you will have no part in me. Right? So he's, they are eating at the king's table. Okay? And it needs to be sent forth. And there, kingly authority is given. That's exactly where Moses was told, You will go forth. You were given authority to speak. So, first we find on the, with this table incident, what is happening? There's oil, being anointed with oil, and then the cup runs over. That's the order. Okay, oil. In my previous um, devotional that I did, um, I um, testified of the 40-day fast that Father had been going on. And I went up to day 20, where he showed me a, a vision of a crow um, with a napkin on pointing to Elijah in 1 Kings 17, where the Lord God said to him, I have commanded the ravens to give you bread, meat, and water. So he was telling me to break my fast. And then he also showed me in a vision a, a, a gift box, a light blue gift box with a satin blue ribbon. And he told me he's given me a gift. And then he showed me that this gift is the oil of gladness. And I didn't want to finish the fast. You can listen to that uh, devotional. Um, but the day 20 was the day that he knew that he worked in me that which he predetermined for the fast. And that um, the only person that would be able to stop me from completing that fast was him. And that's what he did, to my dismay, actually. Okay, so he chose specifically day 20 because um, not too long ago, he kept on repeating the number 20 to me in one day. 
I don't know how many times, but it was ridiculous how many times. And when I looked up G20, it means gladness, fatness, best choices, finest, and feed. Now remember, the, the priest received the choices, the best, the finest. And remember, I also spoke earlier about the, uh, 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 the donkey, where it means fire, or furnace, and ash heap. And I mentioned that they eat the priests eat the fatness of the ash. Okay, so once again, this oil points to priesthood. And remember what we discussed about what priesthood entails. You are made into a priest through the furnace of suffering and affliction, eating at his table. So, um, I noticed that I had 275 subscribers um, and I decided to look up the number and I saw, no, okay, doesn't mean anything, doesn't do anything to my spirit. And then I saw that I had 75% of my battery. So I was like, ding, 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 look up the number 75. So I looked up the number 75 and it means, in the Greek, G75, it means to contend for a prize and warfare. Okay, this is what the uh, workers will be do they are running a race to receive a crown that can never fade away and they will be doing warfare without a doubt the hebrew h75 means to fatten and feed so their father was once again very particular in the numbers whatever numbers he gave me it's specific for that moment that i need to take note either confirming or guiding me to something else so once again, we see the oil is, is talking about that fatness, the favor, the gladness, the, the choices, the best. Remember the words, the best. Okay, so um, oil is directly linked to priesthood. And we know that an olive needs to be crushed to produce that oil. So it's directly linked to suffering and, and oil is needed for a fire. Okay, so we find also that with Solomon's temple that he was given, and Solomon is obviously a type and shadow of Christ, and wisdom, and Solomon was given specific instructions how to prepare the temple to the T. And right at the end where everything was finished, he had such a huge sacrifice. I can't remember how many sacrifices were made, but it is ridiculous. I can't imagine how the... Priests were, were responsible in the outer court to prepare these sacrifices were drenched in blood to prepare it. So you cannot separa separate priesthood from sacrifice. And we are a living sacrifice laying our lives down. So where there were animal sacrifice, now we as Christ, as royal priesthood in him, are also sacrifices, right? Laying our lives down. So you cannot separate that. But what happened after the sacrifices took place? Glory filled the temple, his train filled the temple, and they could not stand. So we see once again, it's first the oil, first the oil, first Mount Horeb, first the setting apart, first being made into a priest. Okay, so the cup that's running over speaks about our mouth. Remember, the word says, out of the abundance of our heart, we speak. And that immediately takes us to Acts uh, two, where we read where uh, tongues of fire appeared above their heads and they began to speak. And so from out of their innermost being, their cups ran over, right? So whatever's in the cup, whatever's in your heart, the cup, your mouth will speak. So they were filled with the Spirit of God as it was poured over them and they started to speak in, an, in other languages, now, if we go to Psalm 45, we read about, uh, Psalm 45 is about praising David of how, what an uh, amazing king he is and that he loves righteousness and it talks about his clothes that he's dressed in. It's just a beautiful psalm. But it, there's a particular verse that caught my attention. And obviously we know David is a type and shadow of Christ. So here he's in his kingly capacity. In verse 7 he says, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So once again we see this hating wickedness and loving righteousness. Not just, you know, I'm not okay with that. Loving righteousness. And that the 
the, that has been anointed with the oil of gladness. Okay, so the best is given. The choices, the finest, um, the fat, the oil, right? That is given to the priest. And that is immediately brought my attention um, to the wedding of Cana. We find that um, Yeshua and his disciples, they were invited to a wedding. And usually what happened in that time is that they would give the best wine first because as the evening or the day went, because it's obviously a whole day, the, the wine would be watered down specifically uh, with water um, so that the people wouldn't know the difference because by that time, I suppose they were probably tipsy by then. Um, the wine wasn't as strong as our wine then. But anyway, so the water would be... But when the wine was finished, Yeshua came, right? And he turned the water into wine. And what is exclaimed by the bride, I think it's the bridegroom, somebody at the bridegroom uh, at the wedding said, you have left, you have chosen the, to leave the best for last. And usually the best was, first, but was served first. And that's a type and shadow of the best that is given to the Levites. The best, the finest, the choices to those who have been anointed and appointed as sent ones to be sent forth. They receive the best. So that's a type and shadow of Acts. Now, let's first go to, before I go too much into that, um, it says here, Let me just read what I wrote here. I said here, um, you have be left the best for last. A type and shadow of the coming revival that will overshadow all other revivals that have ever been. We need to understand that we are now at the last days. We are literally there. There is not going to be a revival after this one that is going to take place. He has left the best for last. He's not just left the best for his priest, but he's left the best for last. Okay, so Father brought the number 36 also upon my heart, and he, le he guided me to Psalm 36, and verse 8 caught my attention. And it says, They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. Now, before verse 8, it talks about the righteous. And thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. So we've got fatness and river of pleasures. And immediately, immediately, rivers of thy pleasures points to John 4, where Yeshua meets the Samaritan woman at the well. And he tells her that if she knew who he was, she would ask him to give her water. And the water that he will give her will well up, a cup, will well up and rivers of living water will flow out of her. And he says to her, but the Father, there's a time coming and the time is now that the Father is seeking those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. So He's saying to her, those that are worshipping Me in spirit and truth, those who come up the mountain, right? Those who seek Me, um, not an experience. They, they who worship Me in truth. In other words, they walk in righteousness. They walk the talk. They are set apart. They will experience this living water that will come. Now, obviously, there are many people that are filled with the Spirit, that are speaking in tongues. Um, but this is a type and shadow of the revival. Now, the reason why I say that is the Samaritan woman is a Gentile. And the Jews in that time um, referred to the, maybe still, referred to the Gentiles as dogs, as unclean, they are dogs. And in the context of this, this dog means man's best friend, um, with particular to Yeshua, because we hear that he talks to his disciples and he calls them his friends. Right. So this woman now goes as one being sent and she runs immediately to her town in Samaria and she tells all the people of the man she met. And what happens? This one person has a meeting. Remember, she came up a hill. The, the well was separated. It was Jacob's well, right? So she goes to this well and she meets him there. And, and, and she then goes forth as one from up the hill down 
think of Mount Sinai. And she tells him of whom she meet, met. And the whole town comes out to meet him. She brings in the multitude to him. And they, they want him to stay. And many are saved. And they believe that he is truly the son of God. And the prophet that was foretold. So you see this type and shadow. But those are the, 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 that outpouring is for those who are worshipping in spirit and in truth. The priests. Okay. So um, just... From these few examples that we've received now and that I've read now, we see that oil is related to priesthood. Oil comes from olives that are pressed, so it talks about suffering, and that's what priesthood uh, precludes priest, uh, priesthood. Oil is about setting someone apart, just like David, uh, uh, Samuel poured oil over his head to anoint him. Oil has every priesthood has got to do with being set apart unto God. <clears throat> unto service, but also set apart unto serving people, um, these people. And the oil comes before the wine, that which represents glory. Okay, so let's see the wine, the cup that runs over. Um, once the first mention of oil was when Moses was told um, by the Lord God how to prepare this oil, and he was very specific about it. Um, and he was then told to anoint Aaron and the priests. And afterwards, the priests were told, the Levites were told to wait outside of the tabernacle for seven days. And there they had to wait and wait and wait. And you can imagine, that is what you call set apart. Because the whole of the congregation went on about their lives. And they would see these priests. And obviously the example that they said, they were not allowed to speak. And here they were, and they were waiting outside of the camp. And when seven days have uh, uh, as uh, finished, the Lord came down um, with a cloud, with a pillar of a cloud down into the tabernacle and glory fell. So there was this waiting for seven days. And we find more or less the same example of the apostles that were told beforehand that they had to wait until the promise of the Holy Spirit would come and they would, uh, uh, the Spirit would pour over them. And they waited for 10 days. But the interesting part is they were never told they will have to wait 14 days. They were just told that we'll have to wait. So they were waiting in prayer and supplication before God in unity amongst one another. They were in unity, right? And as they were waiting, one can only think when they read, uh, reach day seven or eight or whatever, thinking, how long is it going to take? Did we hear right? So there is a process in this waiting before God where something needed to happen. Just like in my fast, he needed to work something in me to day 20. And I was fully prepared to day, to day 40. But he needed to work something in me. And once that was worked in me, he could talk to me about the oil. Right? And I could stop. In the same way, they were waiting and they didn't know that they were going to wait for 10 days. But something happened in them in that time of preparation. Right? It's still talking about a setting apart. So let's read about this account. So before I say that, seven is the number of rest. Remember, the donkey inclines and he rests. That means faith. Right? Um, and 10 is the number for completion. Until that which needed to happen is completed in them. Okay, so let's read Acts 2, starting verse 1. And we're going to see the type and shadow that's very important for us to, um, to take note of, of what will be. Verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. You can imagine how scared they were. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongue, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Going to verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, okay? Peter, standing up with the eleven, 
lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. He's saying, listen up, people. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Think of the new wine, the best wine, being left for last at the wedding of Canaan. He says, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet of Joel. So now he's going to quote or say what Joel said about the outpouring of the Spirit. And he says on verse 17, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Okay? So this all flesh... What is this referring to? It's not referring that the Spirit will be poured out on everybody. It means that nobody that is those priests, those who have come into priesthood, those who have been prepared for this glory, those who have come into uh, 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 live holy lives and love righteousness, those whom I've prepared, who have made me at Mount Horeb, on all flesh, not just the Jews, on all flesh, I will pour out my spirit. So that is not saying everybody's going to get this power. That is not what it's saying. It is saying I will do it also on Gentiles, not just the Jews, those who are set apart to me. Verse 6, let's go back to verse 6 again. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying unto one another, Behold, not all these which speak Galileans, the same, that's not Jews, and how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. And then it mentions all the different um, uh, nationalities or the different towns where they came from. And it says there in verse 10, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Serene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. So proselytes is G4339 and it means a stranger or alien, one who has come over from a Gentile religion to Ju Judaism. So talking about the Gentiles. So here they are and they're surrounded by the Gentiles. Okay. Verse 11, Cretus and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Verse 18, and then he, he tells them, Peter tells them, the, the prophecy that Joel spoke, he says, And on my servants, and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, they are the servants and the handmaidens. Remember, the donkey means a servant, a handmaiden, a slave. The donkeys, the priests, they will prophesy. Those whom I've chosen and set apart, they that meet me up in the upper room, they that have gone to Mount Horeb and I've called now to Mount Sinai, they will prophesy. I will pour my spirit over them and they will glow and gleam with the glory of God upon them. Okay, so you must remember that the Gentiles are included if they are set apart as servants and handmaidens and, and bond slaves unto him. If they did that, if they've gone through that process. So we as Gentiles are the wild olive, olive, the wild olive that has been grafted into the natural olive tree. Okay, Romans 11, verse 19 in Acts 2. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 37. This is the multitude talking to the apostles now. Okay. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, repentance, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. One is received, one is poured out. The Spirit was 
poured out over the apostles in the upper room. But to the multitude, they receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They receive it. It's different. Okay? Poured out is G1632. It means to gush out, run, spill. Okay? The John 4 reference to uh, the Samaritan woman. And the oil, the cup that runneth over. Right? Gush out, run. That's when it's poured out onto the apostles, the chosen ones. Receive is G2983. The multitude will receive when they repent. To take, lay hold of, to claim, give access, gain, and obtain. So we see a clear difference of what will happen. And unfortunately, there is this false idea um, of that is spoken by the wolves that of this revival that will take place all over the world and that people will be endowed with great power, etc., etc. Not true. Not true. Yes, there will be power. Yes, there will be miracles. But that will be on those that are sent forth that he has set apart his donkeys, according to Scripture. Okay. So the cloven tongues is a reference to the cup that runs over in Psalm 23. And out of the abundance of our heart we speak. On my servants and on my handmaidens, those are the bond slaves. Okay, his priests, his donkeys, his servants for Levitical priesthood. And what are we told about the multitudes? They need to repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remittance of sins. And they will receive the Holy Ghost. Okay. Now we read something in verse 43 that points again to Moses and the glory that was seen on him. Verse 43, and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, not the multitude, by the apostles, which we actually see in the type and shadow of Acts. We immediately, as they went out, they started doing miracles and wonders, particularly Ananias and Sapphira, where they died because they lied to the Holy Spirit. And the word says that great fear fall in Jerusalem um, upon them because of the power that were on these apostles. Can you see how he's left the best for last? What will happen uh, in this time in the true revival that will take place is great fear as God will work um, on, on his people through his servants, through his donkeys to bring in this great harvest, the multitude. Okay, let's go to Acts 1 just to further uh, affirm this point or confirm it. We read in verse 8, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem. This is not said to the multitude. They become witnesses, right? They do go out and minister to people. They experience great things and the Lord's love and many people are brought in because of the great work. But the authority and the power is given to the apostles. Okay, so they, the apostles are told they will be witness unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, okay, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So this witnesses is G3144 and it's the word martus and it means martyr. Those who after his example have proved the strength, remember the donkey, jaw, uh, uh, a strong bone donkey, the strength and genuineness of their faith in Christ by undergoing a violent death. So we need to keep this in mind when I, the next DVD, uh, DVD in the next video, um, when I will speak about the Johns. So they are chosen. Verse 24, and they prayed and said, now look how they the apostles beforehand knew that they had to be 12 to fulfill prophecy. So they go to the Lord and they are praying and they're saying, we know they need to be 12 because Judas fell away, right? There was something about Judas and the donkey as well, right? When he died. Hmm, interesting. Um, so they go to the Lord and say, we need an extra person. They don't just grab somebody that's saved, uh, you know, we know there's other people that's been his followers. Let's just get this guy. No, they pray. And these are the words they are praying. They're saying in verse 24, Thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. Once again, very, very specific. We are going to wait in the upper room, but there need to be 12 of us. Okay. Um, 
which one that you have prepared whose heart you know are the chosen one. So chosen is G1586 and it means to pick out, choose out for oneself, choosing one for an office, judging one fit to receive the favors and separated from the rest of mankind, to be peculiarly his own and to be attended continually by his gracious oversight, to select. So you can see the power is going to fall on those that have been prepared. The other day I woke up at 5.36 and I looked up Strong's 5.36 and it means first fruits, the beginning. Remember, Acts, the outpouring of the Spirit will be the beginning of the tribulation that will start. It will start with the outpouring and then the tribulation. What happened? The outpouring happened, many people got saved, multitudes got saved, and then persecution happened. Okay, so they are the first fruits. 5.36 is first fruits, the beginning of a sacrifice, the earliest crop of the year. So the, the apostles are the first fruits of the Lord God. And the multitude is the great harvest. Okay. And the, uh, it comes from the word archae, the Strong's 536. And um, that's the number H746. And it means rule, kingly or magisterial, rulers, magistrates, and beginning. Remember, they sit at the king's table in Psalm 23, given kingly authority. They are giving magisterial authority to rule and reign. And this is what we also understand, that during the millennial reign, they will receive a kingdom. They will receive cities to rule and reign over. They are the priests who take their crowns and lay it before his feet at the end when he comes. And that is their reward, their inheritance. If you look at Joshua, at the end of Josh, the book of Joshua, they receive an inheritance, a land. That's a type and shadow of it. We read about this, that particular uh, 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 instance in Luke 22, verse 24 to 30. So you can look that up. Okay. Um, actually, you know, I can tell you about this. I had a dream probably four years ago. I knew very little about this. And in this dream, very short dream as well, in this dream, I dreamed that I was in a, a canteen or a cafeteria somewhere. And I was there was a lot, a lot of people there. And I had this tray and I wanted to get up to put the tray at the counter. And a man came to me, probably in his 20s or so. And he came to me and he said to me, out of the blue, he just said to me, you will rule and reign over, and he gave me the city's name. So I was like, uh, okay, I need to get away from this guy. <laughs> so I walked away, and I came to the, the counter, and another guy came to me, and he said, you will rule and reign over, and he gave me another city's name. So I, the Lord God has already told me two cities that he said I will rule and reign over. I'm not saying this to boast. I'm saying to saying this so that you understand this is a reality. We read these things and we don't comprehend. We do not take it in. We do not understand how serious it is what he has prepared us for. He needs to trust us with the authority and power that he will give us. Okay. So the other day I had, uh, 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 I, I, you know, after he showed me many of these things and revealed it to me, I watched a movie. <clears throat> no, that's not the part I want to tell you about. Um, I, I saw uh, 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 somebody that made a video um, about this Asbury revival that's taking place at the moment. And they were uh, showing how they didn't agree with it and, and all those kind of things. And it was quite... Uh, 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 quite telling what they were saying and it's no denying what they were saying um and you know i i was immensely sad um after that very 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 sad and I, what i want to tell you now is is that the call upon my life um, my prophetic call upon my life he told me is not so much to talk about things that will happen in the future he, he does show me things that will happen in the future and he does give me warning dreams and all those kind of things. But he told me specifically that the call upon my heart is to reveal his heart. Okay, that's why in revealing his heart is preparing his workers. 
you know, it's good and fine if we know what will happen in the future, but we need the character that will sustain us and help us through it. So that is the call upon my heart. And the very first words he spoke to me when I was 16 years old, is the first time I heard him speak to my spirit. These are the words that he said to me. He said to me, you will seek me and you will seek me with your whole heart and you will find my love and you will paint the colors of my love. Now, I paint myself, but that's not what he meant. What he meant was that I will, he will cause me to be able to express the different colors of his love, whatever they may be. And obviously that is a great honor and, and he receives all the honor and glory. The point I want to make is when he showed me that I specifically, uh, uh, I, at that time, I didn't know really what he meant. But this was a process of sanctification that he brought me into. Okay, so I felt uh, I felt his heart when he became uh, um, when I became sad. I was sad the whole day, and I couldn't understand why I was so sad. And I thought maybe it's about the people coming against me. And I started praying for people and um, just forgiving them again and those type of things. And um, but afterwards, I felt no, I'm still sad. I'm not, and I'm not just sad. I am very, very sad. And I started crying and crying. And then as I cried, I realized this is not my tears. This is not my sadness. I am sensing his sadness. And it was very deep. And he was sharing his heart with me. And then I said to him, Lord, what are you sad about? Why, why are you crying? And he said to me, they seek revival and not me. And doesn't that point to those, the multitude, um, that had their golden calf and wanted their revival. But they did not want to seek him on the mountain. They, did, they were not willing to go through the process of Mount Horeb, where he could call them to that mountain. They wanted the quick fix. They wanted that which is sensual, that which is great, that which is amazing, that, that kind of thing. And... I want to just put a disclaimer here before I get attacked. <laughs> I'm not saying that there are not people at that particular revival, which I think is now no longer, they stopped it. I'm not saying that there are not sincere people there. Of course there's sincere people there. And of course, Father, touches those who are sincere. But his heart is saddened by those who flocked to it because of the experience they wanted. They wanted the euphoria, the, 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 the amazing experience and waiting outside and all that. It doesn't mean everybody that went there went for that purpose. But the majority did. Let's face it. And he was saddened by it. So we need to understand that he knows our hearts and this is the point I want to make with regards to this. Is that the enemy knows how to take our sincere motives to want to be close to him and experience his love and affection and affirmation and approval and touch. The enemy knows how to use that as a bait to take our eyes actually off him whilst we're thinking our eyes are on him. So we equate seeking revival as, a, as seeking him. But it's not the same thing. And he knows a heart. And only he can show that to every individual. So I'm not judging anyone. He's the judge. But we are to go before him and say, Lord, search my heart. You know my heart. Whether I was truly seeking you or the experience. Okay, so in Acts 2 is a type and shadow on whom the Spirit will be poured on, those chosen. Okay, it's not the massive amount of people, the multitude that the Spirit will be poured on, but they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, but not the outpouring of power to prophesy and do all those things. Um, okay. And also an important thing that we need to understand, the outpouring on the apostles was for the equipping of the apostles. And they didn't stay there and say, listen, um, that makes me think on the Mount of Transfiguration where um, Yeshua was transfigured and Elijah and Moses showed up, right? 
and um, Peter said, let's, let's build a tabernacle here. Let's stay here on this mountain. I mean, <laughs> one for each of you, okay? Let's stay here because this is the bomb. This is amazing. No, no, he had to come down. He had to come down into the multitude. And so Peter didn't understand that. And the P Peter is a description of the church that wants to abide in this lovely feeling. They want to stay here. Let's build our tabernacle here, right? Let's stay right here. But no, that transformation that takes place with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in power is for the equipping of the apostles and those workers to go out into the multitude and call them to repentance. Okay. So, um, I actually cried for about two days like that. So it was quite painful for my heart as well, physically sore. Um, the other thing that I want to say as well, we are called to follow the shepherd. We are not called to follow the sheep. And this is one thing that I've noticed amongst the, his children, is that they are prone to want to... Um, they hear of something that's happening here, they run after that. They hear something's happening here, they run after that. Um, and I'm reminded of Yeshua that said, when you hear them say, Christ is here, do not go. Christ is on the mountaintop, or Christ is here, or Christ is in the valley, or where, do not go. And this is what's happening. People are shouting, the revival is here, the revival is here. Come here, come, come look at this, come look at this. God is doing amazing things. And the people, the sheep are, flop, are, are just running after one another, running after one another. And um, you can imagine if you just see a field full of sheep, everybody's running after, the sheep are running after each other. And you know, in, in previous years, it was like uh, when it was the Word of Faith movement, everybody started running after that. When it was the uh, heavy shepherding movement, everybody was running after that. When it was um, uh, 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 the Brownsville revival and stuff like that, everybody ran after the Pensacola one. Um, when it was uh, deliverance movements that were so great, everybody I was in deliverance stuff. Um, I remember in my days... Uh, Certain books always like highlights. Everybody's running. Everybody has to have that book. Um, at that time, it was Tommy Tenney's uh, Seek, uh, God Seekers or Seekers God Chasers. Sorry. Um, the other one is the shack. Everybody wanted to. Everybody and the Lord said to me, "When you see the multitude running, when you see them running, no, that is where you are not to go. You are called to follow the shepherd, not the sheep." Okay. So I take note when I see here goes the flock. <laughs> or the sheep, not the flock, the herd of sheep. So where they go, um, then I know, take note. Okay. Um, I then received, um, after this, I received from my friend Stacy. I received uh, uh, this uh, dream that uh, Sister Donna from the Servant of God channel, um, I, she sent it to me to tell me that uh, she wanted somebody to interpret the dream. And um, she was wondering if um, if this may be applicable to what Father is showing me and that I need, can just see if I can interpret it. And as I said, um, Father gave me the interpretation. So I want to read this dream and you will just see how applicable this dream is once I um, read it to you and I'll give you the interpretation as well. I'm going to read it in the first person. In the dream, I'm riding in the back of a car. My son is in the car with me and I'm showing him my right hand. I'm showing him that on every finger there is a knot. He says, yes, I see them. There are five. I say, pay attention to the five. And he says, I will. He takes out a cigarette. Now my son does not smoke. And I say to him, you know I don't allow any smoking around me. I never have. And he said, you are, a pay, a, you are to pay attention to the six. So she tells him to pay attention to the five. He tells her to pay attention to the six. It is six and it is time for burning and fire. But you are, you are to pay attention to six. And I say, Donna says, I will, I will pay attention to six. And he hands me a key and I take the key and I ask, what am I to do with this key? And he said, anything that you want, you can do with this key. 
I then meet up with some people and I'm asking them, does anyone interpret dreams? Now I'm in a dream telling them about this dream that I'm having. And they say, yes, there's one person here and he can tell dreams. And he walks up to me all dressed in black and even has on a little black hat. And he said, I interpret dreams. Tell me your dream. And whilst I'm telling him of the dream about the five knots on the fingers and the sixth, meaning burning and fire, I start seeing him looking like he's dizzy, swaying back and forth. And he starts to speak in tongues and falls over into a ditch to vomit. And he never interprets the dream. And I stand up and I tell the people that are watching, do you see that? And they say, yes, he's speaking in tongues. I see the example. <laughs> and I say, I want you to know something. That is not tongues. There is a tongue in language that the devil can mock. That is what he is doing. He is mocking the tongues. Now, one of the men stands up and say, you would know, Donna, wouldn't you? And I say, yes, I would. I know that that is not tongues. I know there is a language that the devil can mock, and that's what he is doing. He is vomiting up the spirit that is in him. It is an unclean spirit, and it is being vomited up. And everyone says, it is time to sleep. And I lay down and I say, I'm not sleepy, and it's not time for me to sleep. And they say, cover up your head anyway, and make it look like you're sleeping. So I cover up my head like everybody else is and I hear the Holy Spirit saying to me in the dream, Donna, be aware. Donna, wake up. And I say, my Lord, I'm not asleep. And when I uncover my head beside me, under a blanket is something standing up. And I'm warned by the Holy Spirit of God to take a hold of it. And when I take a hold of it, it's a snake. And it is a big snake. And I grab the serpent by its tail. And everyone is screaming, the serpent will bite you. And the serpent in my hand is trying to talk to me. And I am warning the people, don't listen to the serpent. He will try to harm you or charm you. Don't listen to him. And I take the serpent and I swing him around three times. I throw him to, his field, to this field and he stands up. He's looking at me and I am looking at him. And then he runs as fast as he can going back down on the ground. He's moving so fast through the grass, and I warn the people, he is not done yet. So here's the interpretation of the dream. Please consider everything that I spoke about. The car in your dream speaks of either a person's life, a journey, or ministry. In this case, it speaks of your ministry. You and your son are in the back seat while someone else is driving. The driver would be the Holy Spirit that is in control of your ministry. Your son represents Yeshua speaking to you. He is the son. A person's right hand speaks of power and authority. That is why Yeshua is at the right hand of the father. All authority and power belongs to him. He also upholds us with his right hand. In this case, your hand with the five knots on each finger represents the authority given to the fivefold office, office of apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist and pastor. We say, tie a knot to it when we want to remember something. And you are saying to him that he must remember them. And he says, he will. In other words, he will take care of them. The fivefold ministry all have a shepherding function in that they are to come care for the flock. Remember the donkey. How they care for the flock differs according to their office. They have been given the authority to take up serpents. Your son smoking and you saying that you do not allow any smoking in showing your disposition towards smoke. This smoking is pointing towards that which is a smoke screen or it is all just smoke and mirrors. A reference to magicians who use smoke and mirrors to deceive. The number six is the number of man. Where you asked him to pay attention to the five knots, he is now saying to you, remember the six. Take note, the six. That will rise up. It will be of man and not of the spirit. The key given is your authority to open or bind in the spirit. Keys represent authority and we've been given all authority in our office over all the power of the enemy. Remember the kingly authority at the king's table in Psalm 23. The next scene in your dream is showing you the sixth finger, so to speak. This is showing you that something man-made is rising to deceive many. It has to do with burning and fire. 
The connection here with regard to burning and fire is twofold. The fire points to the outpouring of the Spirit on people with the evidence of speaking in tongues and signs and wonders, which we read in Acts 2, came as tongues of flames on them. In this you have the correlation of tongues and flames. The other connection with regard to burning and fire is that of desires. Desire is as a flame that burns and many are drawn to outward manifestations. They are drawn to signs and wonders where Yeshua said that it is a wicked generation that seeks signs and wonders. This feeds the flesh that craves to feel the anointing and feeds the longing to feel his love instead of living by faith. They seek the things of God but not him. How subtle the enemy is deceiving father's children by using their longing to be close to him. The man is dressed in black and has a black hat on. The black speaks of deception or darkness. The word says that those who walk in the light will not stumble in darkness. The black that speaks speaks of his mind being in darkness, yet he believes that he can interpret your dream. This brings me to further understanding with regard to the sixth finger. Many believe that because they receive dreams and visions or interpretations, that they are in some kind of office or in authority, and usually they think they are prophets. It is, it is a means by which the enemy ensnares them, believing that the gift constitutes being right in their walk and that they have authority. They depend on their gift and measure themselves by their gift. They would constitute those placed in authority by man and not by God. Becoming dizzy and swaying speaks of becoming drunk in the spirit. But this is not the spirit of God. This is the Kundalini spirit, the snake, we see even with the Indian people and in other religions where they too speak in tongues, but obviously demonic. They also sway in the spirit and look drunk and speak in demonic tongues that sound the same. However, only those with the spirit of God will discern the difference. Vomiting it out is also a manifestation that will take place, as even this too people are drawn to, to see deliverance. But often this deliverance is not lasting because their minds, the black hat, is not renewed. The stronghold remains. The snake will return. Falling into the ditch speaks of his true state and you warn them which is your authority given to you. The people telling you to sleep who also believed in finger number six, you know, you can look to him for interpretation, tells you it is time to sleep. They represent the sleeping church and rightfully you're telling them you are not sleepy and that it's not time to sleep. I believe they were saying to you, Let's not get carried away by this, Donna. God has done a good thing here. Let us cover it up and go to sleep. Being awake, which you tell them the Holy Spirit you are, is the right disposition, of course. You cover your head and oblige them by making it as if you are sleeping. This for me is being undercover, so to speak, to see what the enemy is doing, but also represents how the sleeping church will want to affect those in office, the five fingers, to cover their heads, Heads representing authority over the church and not say anything about these manifestations. The Holy Spirit is saying to you, be aware Donna, wake up, is what the Spirit is saying to those in authority. To wake up and warn the children of the coming deception in the revivals that will start taking place all over this world. The moment you uncovered your head, lifting the veil so to speak, you could see the veiled serpent. That which the sleeping and veiled church could not see. The standing up of the snake is a position of war. Remember the donkey do warfare as well or the sending out is warfare as well. Standing up against the true five fingers of God. This is why you take hold of the snake with your hand representing the fivefold ministry function and authority over the enemy. Grabbing him by his tail is to render him helpless and a snake cannot do much when you do so. This all points to the magicians in Pharaoh's court, where Moses, who wrote the five first books of the word, representing Yeshua, was given a staff to cast it down on the ground, where it was turned into a snake. The magicians were called with their smoke and mirrors, and produced their snakes. We know Moses' snake devoured them. The people react in fear, which is their response with regard to those of the fivefold ministry that is called to stand up against the deception in the church, wanting them rather to put down the snake, lest it bites them. 
They fear more what the enemy can do than what they fear God, who has all power and authority and has indeed crushed the enemy on the cross. The cunningness and deception of this serpent is within the church and is directly linked to a religious spirit, more specifically Jezebel, that will come against his servants. Do not listen to the serpent, he will charm you, is what you say, and also reminds me of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. He did not have a long conversation and tried to deliberate with her, but he ran from her. We are to flee from temptation. What we are finding now is that people are running after signs and wonders, the serpent charming them to seek God, but they are led astray by their burning fire, the burning and fire within their bosoms for that which is not lasting, that which appears true, but is in fact very dangerous. Swinging the snake around three times, speak of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, in whose authority you are doing this swinging and casting the snake from his, from his children. And we know he will be back, which means this is an ongoing war of deception and that you are warning the church, which is what the five fingers should do, that they are to be aware because he will come again. I'm reminded of the scripture where Paul was bitten by the snake and just shook it off in Acts 28. Everybody thought he would die, but Paul knew his authority. You will note in that, chap in that chapter that the barbarous people made a fire. The fire reminds me of the strange fire that our God will not accept because he is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and truth. A viper comes out of the heat. The people thought ill of Paul, saying he must be a murderer. This speaks of persecuting those who come against these false signs and wonders, the apostles. Interestingly enough, the word barbarous in the Strong's is G915, and it means one who speaks a foreign or strange language which is not understood by another. The viper is G2191, and it means and refers to being cunning and offspring of vipers, whom we know are the Pharisees, once again pointing to a religious spirit. Okay, and this is the word Father gave me that comes that I want to end with. The word is come up. I received this word quite a while back. Yes, I'm calling you up to me, and yet nobody can stand before me and live. Therefore, I need all of you. Rightfully, the psalmist asks, who can ascend unto the hill of the Lord, and who can stand in his holy place? Only those who have clean hands, a pure heart, who have not lifted up their souls to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. This is not a play on words, my child. This is for you to know that before you meet me as I am in my holy hill, you cannot stand before me as you are. Know that I am about to prepare you to meet with me. Know that I do in fact require more of you as those who have much, much is required. Therefore, prepare your heart, your mind, to meet with me in my holy sanctuary for year no flesh can abide. Consecrate all of you. You are not to speak your own thing or walk in your own ways, nor defile my Sabbath. The rest I've given you through faith. But you are to hear what I hear, speak what I speak and see what I see. Therefore, a new consecration that requires you to come out of the camp for you to go up. Unless you come out, you cannot come up or go up. More is required, not only that you may meet with me and live, but that I may send you into the camp as one whose face shines with the glory of God. They will see and fear. They will hear and be humbled and know that a prophet has been among them. But just like Moses, they will not hearken to the voice of my speaking, but will harden their hearts, for their hearts are still divided. Therefore, I need all of your heart and undivided heart. Give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. Only then can I send. Only then can you speak as my oracle as one sent by me. Therefore, be zealous to consecrate all of you for the time is short and soon the world and my unbelieving children will behold me in those vessels I have prepared. Not just the infilling, but the vessels itself. Many will come to me, but much more will ridicule and scoff at my chosen ones, for they do not know me. 
Know that those will be from your own household, but also out of the household called church. Brother will turn against brother and sister against sister, for their hearts are envious, and they desire the great things of God out of the lust of the eyes and pride of life. But I search all hearts and know the intents of their hearts to lavish all I give and spend it on their own gain that they may receive the honor. But I will not share my glory and honor. And they will be given over unto a reprobate mind as they serve their own understanding, calling it wisdom, calling it revelation. But they have not heard from me, but have eaten from that tree which I have forbidden from the beginning. They have leaned on their own understanding and have gone their own way, forsaking the way that leads to everlasting life and peace. Therefore, they will reap what they have sown. They will reap thistles and thorns and shall find themselves among scorpions and every creeping thing, even as you will, as I send you to stand in the midst of them and speak my word that will burn as a fire. Therefore, do not fear their looks or words, but know that when I send you, I go with you, standing in the midst of a crooked and wicked generation, just like John, my faithful servant, called out of the camp to say, repent, repent. And just like then, the Pharisees will come out of their dark meeting places into the light and be exposed as the vipers they are, Poisonous asps sent by the wicked one, but fear not, I am with you, just like I was with Moses. No man shall be able to stand before you. No weapon against you will prosper. This is the heritage I have given you. Therefore, be brave and courageous. Set your face as a flint. Do not look to the left or to the right, but come up and be here. Amen. How many of us are so faithful to seek him in that upper room of our heart daily, to seek his presence, to come up and be with him and minister to him. Um, I'm reminded of the woman with the issue of blood that went through the whole throng of people just to be able to touch his hem. And in that moment that she touched his hem, he said, who touched me? And the disciples were like, uh, we all did. There's, there's so many people around you. But he said, no, virtue left me. And that virtue entered her and healed her. When we touch his hem, when we come into his presence, when we seek him for him, right? Virtue is a transaction that takes place in that inner room, in that upper room of our hearts, where we seek him, where we become one with him. The more we come into his presence, where he starts to sanctify us, show us our hearts, prepare us, renew our minds. And more is done in that upper room that can be done in ministry, that can be done in um, just seeking his word, wanting to understand his word or going to seminars or reading books or whatever it may be. I'm not saying we are not to do any of those things. I'm saying your priority must be the presence of God for it's in his presence where he speaks to you face to face. It's in his presence where you come to meet up with who you are. He says in this word, you cannot meet me where I am the way you are. He has to change us. He has to prepare us for this outpouring, for this great responsibility of power that will be given unto us. I pray that you have heard the warning that there will be counterfeit revivals that will break out. That the sheep will just all go in the directions following one another as they've always done. But that if you are a worker, you are to separate yourself from the camp and seek his face and he will empower you and touch you as you are diligent in seeking him. The word says, um, without faith, it's impossible to please him. But he is a rewarder of those 
who seek him. He's a rewarder of those who seek him. And we are to seek him earnestly. And he will meet with us. He will prepare us to be those vessels of glory that he will send out to use with great power. Pray this is blesses you. Um, I will do the transcript shortly that I will add to this devotional and to my blog. Um, also, I want you to uh, please uh, just keep in mind that the next devotional I'm going to call Two Johns and Jezebel, where I specifically will talk about the persecution that will take place um, and, uh, and about who these Johns are. And, um, and it just holds on to with all of this as well, that we can understand what awaits us. Um, bless you for listening and taking the time um, for, for watching this video. Amen.